As a vintage hardware enthusiast, what's the first thing that pops into your head when I say 90s ultra portable PC? Perhaps the Toshiba Libretto? Or maybe some of the more keen people would say the Sony Vio C1 picture book? Or even some of the folks in Europe might say the Casio Cassiopeia? Cassiopeia? I don't know how to say that. Casio Fiva MPC. But just how many of you would have thought to say NEC Mobio? This right here is the NEC Mobio NX MB20C, which was sold as part of NEC's PC98 NX series of systems. I'm not going to bother going on about the history of the PC98, but what's important to know is that the PC98 series was starting to see a decline in sales by the mid-90s. The NEC PC98 is not a platform that is 100% IBM PC compatible either. For quite a while, it did find itself as a staple PC in Japanese households, but as tech really started ramping up by the mid-90s, NEC's proprietary platform was struggling to keep up in a space that was becoming more and more dominated by the IBM PC compatibles. Companies like Fujitsu and Sharp had already jumped ship and started producing cheap IBM PC compatible systems. And even outside companies like Compaq had a go at entering the Japanese PC market. By 1997, the writing was on the walls for NEC's Japanese PC division, and they were ultimately forced to make the move to producing PC compatible systems as a means to keep their PC division going. This leads up to the PC98 NX series. The first PC compatible lineup of PCs produced by NEC Japan which debuted right at the end of 1997. Now you might be thinking, hey hey hold on, I swore NEC was selling PC compatibles in the early 90s in America, and you're right. However, these were merely Packard Bell systems with NEC branding on them. Very sneaky. NEC did this as an attempt to make an entry into the US market However, it failed pretty miserably due to some issues internally with Packard Bell. At any rate, this little Mobio is amongst the very first PC compatible systems made by NEC. It was a short-lived system, seeing a sales period of about a year before slowly being killed off by early 1999. The Toshiba Libretto, which it was competing with, would continue to live on successfully until around the early 2000s. When it first debuted, the Mobio was offered with a 120MHz Pentium MMX, dual scan STN display, 16 or 32 megabytes of RAM, an ESS audio drive, and a Neomagic Magigraph 128ZV. The 120 megahertz systems were called MB12C UDs. I'm guessing MB means Mobio, 12 probably means 120 megahertz, and C means color. There were also MB12Cs which had TFT displays. These were called MB12C UVs. These systems were otherwise identical to the UD, but all of them had 32 megabytes of onboard RAM, regardless of the model. By early to mid-1998, the Mobio saw a slight refresh with a revised PCB layout, slightly newer RAM, though still EDO, the Plus version of the 128ZV, and they also only had TFT screens. Oh, how could I forget? They also had a 200 megahertz Pentium MMX in them now. Appropriately, the name changed to MB20C. 20, probably referring to 200 megahertz. And one last thing I'll note about the, all of these different Mobio models is that across all of them, ignoring the one model that has only 16 megabytes of RAM and the DSTN and TFT situation going on, the only difference between them was really what Office software they came with, if any. Some had Microsoft Office and some had Ichitaro Office 8. All right, so with the boring, historical, and informative stuff out of the way, why am I showing this thing to you? Well, because I believe it's superior to the Toshiba Libretto, and it's also just really cool. However, back in the day, this unit was probably not such a compelling option versus the very popular Toshiba Libretto. At that point, Toshiba had built up a name for its rapidly popular UMPCs. There was lots of support for them, and they had numerous port replicators, some with USB and some even with fans. In the case of the 100 series, they had dual PCMCIA, along with an 800x40, 7.1 inch display, and all librettos in general supported booting off PCMCIA floppies. And hey, they even had the choice of compact or larger batteries. Although at the time of writing the script, I didn't realize that NEC also provided a double capacity battery. The fact is, is that these Toshiba librettos were quite popular and they were both the dominator and the creator 
of the short-lived UMPC market. So now we have the similarly priced NEC Mobio. Well, it has a 640x480 six inch display. In some cases, it's a dual scan, ugh. Only one PCMCI slot for a system that is already very limited in how many ports it has. And speaking of that, it comes with a very small port replicator that doesn't have USB and a proprietary floppy disk drive that only worked with the Mobio. And this is the only way to boot from floppy as well. You can't boot from a PCMCI floppy. Otherwise, the specs were nearly identical to the Libretto, but the Libretto had so much more support and so much more attractive offerings, like the dual PCMCIA and the bigger screen and whatnot. But hey, we're in the year 2024 now. We don't care about having some Road Warrior laptop that lasts hours on a charge, has a slightly bigger screen than its competitor, and has more room for expansion via PCMCIA. We care about serviceability and usability. Can it run Doom? Can it easily be opened? Can it easily be upgraded? Can parts for it be found easily enough? Toshiba Librettos are known to use proprietary memory modules, and they're very hard to track down, and when you do find one, they're way too expensive. Also, the non-standard resolution of the display panels on the newer Librettos make running things in DOS a little bit weird with the display stretching and letterboxing. Also, Librettos can't be taken apart without literally crumbling to dust due to their cheap plastic design. Also, the battery packs in the Libretto's use 17670 cells, which are no longer manufactured. They need to have small, non-standard height laptop hard drives as well. And the screens, at least at the 100 series, were notorious for developing vertical lines. The Mobio, on the other hand, has kind of fared better. The TFT models usually don't have any screen issues, however the same cannot be said for the dual scan models. They should be avoided at all costs because they will always always be destroyed from screen vinegar syndrome. And to add insult to injury, the replacement panels are so insanely expensive for such a garbage looking screen. The Mobio does not break when being opened up as the top and bottom half are made of magnesium. However, the mid frame and screen bezel are still made of plastic, so you gotta exercise some degree of caution. Upgrading memory is as easy as finding a regular 32 or 40 megabyte laptop EDO module. The hard drive is a standard two and a half inch laptop drive, so that's still pretty common to find. They also have a standard sized aux jack, unlike the earlier librettos. They also use what I consider to be a more common pointing setup with a nub and two buttons at the bottom versus librettos unique, but not for everyone pointing config, which involved basically having your thumb and, and fingers on the screen or the screen bezel at all times. The battery pack is made of three CGR18650 cells. And despite being early 18650 cell technology, they can still be replaced pretty easily enough with newly manufactured cells. The screen is 640x480 as I mentioned, so there is absolutely zero display stretching for MS-DOS applications. So Anything DOS related looks right at home on this screen. They also seem to have a dedicated heat spreader inside them, unlike librettos, which mainly relied on a long, thin piece of metal to dissipate the heat. But not all is perfect. As I mentioned, there are issues with the dual scan screens, so you will want to avoid those entirely. Libretos seem to have new old stock or at least secondhand parts pop up sometimes, but the Mobio, due to its short-lived existence, does not get such treatment being difficult to find even junk systems for parts use. You also have to have a working PC VP UU01 external floppy drive as there is no other way to load an OS onto the system. You can't even get away with starting the install by putting the drive in another system and then putting it back in the Mobio halfway through. It simply won't boot. They also seem to have a very weird tendency to eventually refuse to power on. Yeah, I know, that's kind of a big issue. In particular, they take a charge, but they don't respond to the power button being stripped at all. And despite these issues, big and small, I still find the Mobio far more enjoyable to use in the libretto for the following points. The 640x480 screen, as I mentioned, is really, really good for applications that run natively at that resolution and DOS stuff. The earlier librettos had a 640x480 screen, but they had much slower CPUs. The Mobio, on the other hand, gets a faster CPU and retains that low screen resolution. My battery is rebuilt as well, so I can take it with me wherever I want. The same can't be said about most librettos, which have ancient battery packs that are dead and cannot be rebuilt. 
So, honesty time. I lied about the battery, but in my defense, at the time of writing my script, my battery had been sent off to a battery rebuilder for cell swap, and they didn't say that they had any issues. However, I did tell them if they couldn't program the EEPROM, which we'll get to that in a minute, uh, just replace the cells because historically that hasn't been a problem with uh, NEC NX series systems because this is not my first PC98 NX laptop. So they didn't say whether or not they had issues with the programming the EEPROM, they just replaced the cells and they said, yep, it's good, brand new cells. So unfortunately, in the beginning, when you would plug in the laptop, it would charge for a couple seconds and then the LED would blink. Now it just goes straight to blinking and the system, I mean, it couldn't before but it still can't power off the battery windows doesn't detect it but the system does at a hardware level understand that something is there but it refuses to use it it won't charge it it won't power off of it i had thought foolish mistake that i could just swap the cells and be done because my versapro nx which is from the pc98 nx series had a very similar problem but not the same problem it recognized that a battery was there but it would never charge it it would just sit at a amber light this is a bit different. It's a blinking amber light and it didn't recognize a battery. So I suspect that was my, my fault big time there for assuming they were the same problem or same enough of a problem. So my theory now is that since these are brand new cells and they don't even charge for like two seconds and then start blinking, they go straight to blinking. The cells inside these systems are probably actually okay for the most part. There's some sort of circuitry related issue going on inside the pack itself. Maybe it's something to do with the EEPROM, I'm not sure, but I don't think it's actually possible to fix these batteries which is really unfortunate. So they go into the pile with the Toshiba Libretto batteries, which are basically impossible to fix as well, unless you can somehow find some skewer 17670 cells that are used, but still have something of a charge. The normal aux jack lets me plug in my headphones so I can hear stereo sound and just the more natural placement of the pointing device feels more ergonomic for me anyways. And the size of it is more like the early Librettos, the pre 100 series. So it, it, it feels nice to hold. Also, taking these things apart is so easy, like insanely easy to do. The Toshiba Librettos, on the other hand, are just a nightmare to take apart and they just completely snap and crumble into pieces. Let me show you how easy it is to take one of these things apart. Fair warning, I filmed this before I got access to my tripod again, so I apologize if it's kind of hard to follow along with me. Taking apart the Mobio is actually not too hard. The majority of the screws are actually going to be on the bottom all through here. There are a couple of other screws though. You have this screw here which uses a smaller head. There is also some two hidden screws underneath, underneath this piece of plastic here. So to start we're going to want to remove this little plastic piece here. I recommend getting some sort of a spudger and you'll notice that there are little slots. You can fit a spudger under there and use that to actually get into lift it like this. You see how it's coming up now? So you just go like that. You want to be careful not to put too much pressure on because you don't want to break it. But there's several of them. Oh, let me just do that. There are several of them along here, and you can just one by one go through and lift them up. It'll just pop up like this. But you'll see what I'm talking about, these little holes here. So that's where you want to lift up on the spudger. It's usually easiest to go with the little, the little tap icon is right there, because that's the middle. Screw one and screw two for the top are right there. And they use a size zero Phillips head screwdriver, so you can just gently take them off. And the keyboard should now come forward like this. We're gonna go ahead and lift up the keyboard. And now there's a ribbon cable underneath here that we're gonna have to take care of. You'll see there's a little plastic tab thing there. And one of the things you gotta be careful about, the mouse ribbon cable, which is tucked away back here. Very easy to break. We have a little process for carefully getting that off that we'll go into later, but we're just gonna take and use a spudger tool here and push up on this. Trying to do this one-handed is not easy. And just like that, it comes out. All right, so at this point, we have taken off the top plastic cover there. 
removed the two zero Phillips screws there, flipped over the keyboard, removed the ribbon cable here that's secured using one of those, uh, I guess they call that ZIF, zero Infer insertion force connector. Now we have to close the lid, flip the device over, and begin unscrewing all the screws on the bottom. So we'll change out our bit to a size one Phillips screw and begin taking everything out. Next, we will remove this tiny little screw here. It's a different size than the others, so make note of it. Now we're gonna very carefully open it up because it probably would have closed in the process of all that. And this is where things start to get a bit tricky. So first off, you're gonna wanna remove this connector here, which is for like power and the screen and stuff. So you can just use something to prop under it like that. Easy enough. What I normally do from here on out is I put the laptop on its side, kind of like this, and I work at it from the top. So as you can see, I would run a spudger tool kind of in along here and work my way around here. There are plastic clips and they probably will break. You just have to be extremely careful not to apply too much force. All right, I've got everything unclipped, as you can see. So now we're gonna go ahead and unclip or remove the little ribbon cable here that goes to the mouse and the little mouse nub. What you can do is you can actually lift this up like this and let me focus in on the... So what we'll do is even though it's partially removed because this thing does not want to sit well, we're just going to go ahead and use our spudger to remove it like so and it comes right out. And just like that we can lift the entire top half and it comes off just like that. We can set it off to the side somewhere where it's not going to get damaged. And now we're left with just the board itself. All right, so here's the board. Um, it's really simple from here on out. It just comes out as one piece for the most part. Um, I will say if you're going to remove the board, which I'll show you how to do, make sure your little eject mechanism down here, I can't really show it, it's not picking up on the camera, make sure it's slid all the way that way. You don't want to have it that way because you could end up putting this board back in and forgetting that your PCI PCMCIA eject mechanism, maybe it got dislodged or something, and so you can actually eject. From here, we can take our cable for the hard drive. Just pry up on it. If we wanted to take the hard drive out, which in my case I do, it's pretty simple. Boom, it's out. If you want to take the board out, there's one more screw you got to remove right here. So we're gonna go ahead and then I'll show you how to slide up to remove the motherboard from the shell. It should just be like this. There will be this AC adapter thing which gets in the way, but from there, your board has been removed. Here it is in all of its glory. The back side of it, my hands covering the top side. And while I have you guys here on the inside of this unit, let me take the opportunity to explain what exactly happened with my little overclock that I did. So if you know me, you know that I can't just leave things the way they are. Curiosity usually gets the best of me and I have to mess around with something a little too much. And that's what I decided to do. I found a guide to actually overclock the Mobio. It's really simple, unless you want to overclock it more, then it gets more complicated. The full overclock of 300 megahertz involved cutting traces, wiring in a resistor, and removing stuff. I wasn't really down to do that. So I went with the conservative overclock of 229 megahertz, or supposedly 233, I believe. All it really was was just removing, I believe, a little capacitor. As you can see right here on the screen, that's it. It basically bumps up the clock multiplier of the CPU, if I'm not mistaken. But does that translate to real-world performance? Well, let's get into that. Well, if you remember my Toshiba Libretto FF video where we took that Libretto and brought it up to 300 megahertz, we didn't really see any performance difference and it kind of just generated a bit more heat. And as expected, that's the same result with this NEC Mobio. I, I really noticed no real-world performance difference between 200 and 229 megahertz. So it's probably better not to overclock these things as it just doesn't really go that far. But if you wanted to, you can. 
On the note of performance, I don't really have anything to talk about here. The Mobio actually performs about the same as a Libretto 110 CT or a Libretto SS. I mean, it should. It uses the same CPU, the same memory technology. They even use the same NeoMagic uh, graphics chip. I believe the PCI clock is the same on all, all of those units. So yeah, I mean, really there's not anything to talk about. If you've used a Libretto of the time period, then you can expect the exact same performance out of this little Mobio here. So now that I'm done touching on my various praises for the system, as well as complaints, um, I want to keep up with the informative side of things and kind of briefly go over how I restored this system to its factory image because it did come with the boot floppy disks and the factory recovery CD, which was very cool. If you do not own one of four NEC branded PCMCI CD drives or SCSI cards, which is often what those are connected to, you will need to go the long route of manually loading the drivers for your PCMCI CD drive slash SCSI card and trying to kick off the recovery process. However, it's not so simple. You see, for whatever reason, despite my hours of attempts to load all of the drivers and everything for my particular PCMCIA CD-ROM drive, the recovery process would just not kick off. It would constantly fail to find a CD-ROM drive. So what I ended up doing was actually loading up all the drivers as NEC outlined in their documentation, following the exact same steps. But when the program fails to find a CD-ROM drive and it kicks back out to DOS, I was able to figure out how to manually kick off the recovery process. You just have to run a program and it should work. So from there, I did some more trial and error and I was able to do a custom restore process, which allowed me to partition the drive how I wanted to and, and such. So from there, it was kind of just a long process. At one point, my hard drive died. So I had to go do this all over again with a different hard drive that I had. But it all worked out in the end and it was able to recover from the image. It was able to boot into Windows 98 first edition and everything seemed to work. Now I understand that not everybody has access to a PCMCI CD drive so I have created an image of this factory state and uploaded it to archive.org along with all the instructions. Same for the recovery media also uploaded with very detailed recovery instructions there in English but I will remind you that unfortunately even if you were to dump the ghost images that I created to a drive you'll still need to have access to a NEC floppy drive so that you can run a command to make the drive bootable for the NEC Mobio. Before I conclude the video I'm just gonna drop a couple more informative things just to get some info out here that could be useful for people. Uh, so yeah let's get straight to it. The AC adapter is this weird barrel looking thing. You can actually find uh, the exact same sort of barrel connector on older Fujitsu laptops from the exact same time. And the model number is PCVP-UP01, 15 volts, 2 amps output. Finding EDO memory modules can be a bit of a pain, not because there, there's not many to buy out there, it's more so people want a lot of money for them these days. So if you can somehow stumble across some sort of computer parts lot locally or maybe even a lot of untested RAM online, you have to know what to look for. So here I have a DDR module. Here we have an SD RAM module. This is where things can get kind of tricky. How do you tell? Because they're very similar looking. Well, the notch is actually a little more to the left side on the SDR module, whereas on the EDO module, it's a bit more on the right side. Another way to check and know too is that though not every EDO module is gonna show you its capacity, EDO modules are usually lower capacity, so 16, 32, 64. There might be a 128 EDO module, I think there is, but that's like as high as it goes. Should you need or want to replace the screen on your Mobio MB20C, the part number NL6448BC19-01. This panel made in November of 1998. I'm also gonna quickly mention that you cannot upgrade an MB12C with a passive matrix display to a active matrix display. I've already tried swapping them over. It does not work. It just produces a blank white screen. I did a little bit of fiddling around further and while I know it has something to do with the the, the hardware on the, the board itself, even if you had a passive matrix display when you swapped out this board here, that's when I would start to get issues. So even those little 
driver boards on the side for power and LEDs and stuff are not interchangeable be between the passive and active matrix display models. The mobile floppy disk drives often do not work. They're either stone dead or, if you're lucky like I was, the belt has turned into goop. Now I don't have any suitable replacement belts and I don't know, I don't believe there's any sort of universal belt, one size fits all, it's kind of specific per floppy drive. If you're curious, the model number for the floppy drive is FD1238T. This is not for the enclosure, this is just the drive itself. Now, instead of going out and wasting money trying to find one of these things, which I mean, good luck, I, I noticed something. This little ZIF connector here seems to be kind of a, an actual standard and, and common on these older floppy drives, or at least some of them, the more thinner ones. So as luck would have it, I had a number of spares lying around, these slightly thinner drives for laptops, and they all use the same ZIF connector in the same spot. Now the bottom of these things might be different, um, and you might have to modify the casing a little bit, and you'll probably also have to deal with no front plate, no bezel plate, but it works and that's all that really matters so if your floppy drive doesn't work but you have the connector in the casing don't throw it out go ahead and see if you can find just any old floppy drive that uses the ZIF connector and that's kind of like slightly thinner you'll find these in notebooks the CMOS batteries in these things will always be dead they seem to be a little pair of 3 volt uh, tiny button cell batteries but what you can do is you can actually find a cell for, of a similar size. For example, this cell is the perfect size. And you can actually just cut the battery off. So here would be the battery, here's the connector. You can cut the wire right where the battery is, strip it, and then solder it to a new or used uh, button, button cell battery. And then you can actually connect it to the motherboard and then run it on its side. So instead of laying down flat, it would lay down like this right in here because your hard drive connector ends about right there so it gives you just enough room to tuck it in right there. When it comes to these old displays 99% of the time they're gonna be cooked as you can tell by this one like it's very dim it's very washed out and that's max brightness if you can believe me like look at that max brightness but there's a trick to actually making these displays feel better than what they are. You can see here I have this very big white light it's not a very warm color light bulb, it's very cool. So, because these displays are basically cooked, if you want them to look better and, and feel better, the trick is to use them under warm light bulbs. Just look at how much better the display looks now that I've moved to an area with warmer lighting. I believe this has something to do with the ambient lighting around you kind of tricking your eyes and getting it used to the same sort of color of lighting that's now being emitted from the backlight because it's just old and worn out. That's what happens to these fluorescent tubes. Oh, and in case you're wondering, no, my Mobio is not connected to my VersaPro CD-ROM base. I just put it on here for fun. That's about all I have to say for the NEC Mobio. This video is supposed to be more informative and obviously opinionated as well, as I do believe that these are better than librettos. But I hope you learnt a lot about the NEC Mobio. Uh, if you're looking for one, you know what it is you're getting into. And if you didn't know about their existence, now you know, and maybe you're curious to get one or start looking for one. Either way, the biggest takeaway that I want to give you is that UMPCs, while they're cool, they're definitely not a very good choice when it comes to retro computing. I think they're maybe more of a Sunday driver kind of system. But anyways, thanks for watching.